Welcome to a day of prayer. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Together, let's engage in relationship with Christ through prayer, faith, and His Word. Hello, I'm Promise, and you're listening to Day of Prayer's Morning Bible Study. We're glad you could join us. Before we get into the word, let's pray. Mm-hmm. Lord, just thank you for today. Also, just thank you and invite you into our midst. And just thank you for never leaving us or forsaking us, Lord. And Lord, also just thank you for just showing us your way so that we're not stranded and struggling behind. In the name of Jesus, amen. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to our our Bible study and our continued um, our continued examination of our lives in, in light of the Scripture found in Romans. So, we are in chapter eight, and actually, this morning there is more to discuss with the first part. So, we're going to reread those same scriptures that we went over in the previous podcast. So can I get a volunteer to read verses 1 through 11, please? I will. All right, honey. There's therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, on account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. So then, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he is not his. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Amen. Amen. And amen. Absolutely. So, as is our custom, I want to open the floor up because there's things that the Holy Spirit put on y'all's hearts to share. And, of course, uh, to ask any questions that you have. And um, did not get the opportunity yesterday. So, the floor is yours to, to share what the Holy Spirit is speaking and ministering to you. So, who'd like to begin? Luke. Go. Okay, thank you, Promise. Um, yesterday, or last time, <laughs> Mr. Dean, Mommy, and Dad, you had brought up um, some points about sin and how it keeps us in bondage. And it just kind of reminded me of a, a few scriptures. One was in Isaiah. I just have to find it very quickly. Um. We don't have to find it quickly. You just have to find it. (laughs) Well, true. It was in Isaiah 61. Um, We'll read verse 3. And this is, it depends on your translation, but mine says the good news of salvation, which is the, 
kind of the topic of this passage. So reading verse 3, it says, To console those who mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they may be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. And when I had originally saw this uh, first, I was a little bit confused. I was like, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. And I had asked the Lord, I said, what is the spirit of heaviness? Well, that would be sin. The spirit of heaviness of oppression. That's what sin is. And that brought me to um, Matthew eleven twenty eight. When Jesus was talking about true rest, he said, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And so we see um, the difference in Mr. Dean. You had brought up how many people go, Oh, the God is just trying to get in my way and keep me from having fun. And no, he's really trying to keep you and bring you to the actual enjoyment, the actual fun, if you will, entertainment and rest so that you're not in this place where you are clawing and trying to reach this point in your own strength. And um, how when you're in sin, it's that, that spirit of heaviness and it physically and mentally weighs on a person when they are trying to carry the weight of their own sin sin versus letting God have it. And um, I have had personal experiences that way instead of um, repenting and turning to the Lord, I tried to keep something that I've done uh, that I had done in secret and it physically wore on my body and I could feel it. I wasn't feeling well, my nose was running, my stomach was upset, my head was hurting, all these different things. And it's easily avoidable. One, just don't sin in the first place, as mommy and dad often point out. But when you do, take it back to the Lord immediately. Dad said, don't keep running down the road with it. As soon as you realize that you have made a fault, bring it back to him because he's faithful and just to forgive you when you are truly repenting, not putting on a facade. And how um, God gives us rest. And when we look at our lives and the things that we do, some things sound and look and feel as though it's a lot of work. And you feel tired. But God gives rest. And it's not just the physical act of sleeping in a bed at night and, and going through that cycle. But just having that quietness on the inside of you that is rest and you're not feeling anxious or worried about anything else because you know God has you and he's looking out for your your good and he's looking out for your future he's there to give you a future and a hope not take anything from you not keep you from doing anything he wants you he wants you me everybody in this room our listeners you as individuals to return to him and be his son or daughter he wants you back where you originally were back to that community come back to where you first came from he doesn't want to be separated from you and he doesn't want to be estranged from you so the only way to ensure that you make it there is by doing your part jesus had already done his part he got up on the cross he did everything he was supposed to do now it's our turn and um we shouldn't try to shirk away from that. And I'm talking about myself right now in this moment as well. I shouldn't try to shirk away from being obedient to God because that only costs me in the long run. It may have some impact here in the natural, but when it's all said and done and I'm standing before that throne of judgment, I will, and so will you, have to answer for what you did or didn't do. Hmm. Okay. Okay. Okay, so first the Lord wanted me to bring up verse 7 where it says, verse 7 and verse 8, in chapter 8, sorry. Because the, where it says, because the carnal mind's enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be, so then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. So the Lord's talking to me about how sometimes people... Let me go back. So in Acts, the 
apostles had to wait for the Holy Spirit and how if the apostles they had stands over Jerusalem, right? Yes. They couldn't leave to do anything. Well, the Jesus instructed them not to leave Jerusalem until they had received the Holy Spirit. Yes. So they they waited right, until ultimately the day of Pentecost, right? When they received yes. the Holy Spirit. So they were obedient to what the Lord had commanded them. Yes? Yes. yes. Okay. And how is the same with us? When the Lord tells us to do something, whether it's to wait or go do something, if we try to go, oh no, Lord, I have to do this now, or, well, Lord, I don't feel like it. My body hurts a lot, so. That, but when you walk in, when you're walking in the flesh and you go, oh no, Lord, I don't need you. Like what mommy says, you drive off without the Lord. You get inside the driver's seat when the Lord's trying to get inside the driver's seat. You push him out the way and jump inside the driver's seat and broom him off. And how that's how it's the same with the flesh. You might be thinking, oh, I'm doing the Lord a favor by doing this. But in reality, you're doing both the Lord and yourself a disservice. Mm-hmm. And how a great example of this was Smith Wigglesworth. Um, there was a guy inside of a buggy. The Lord told him to wait. Originally, Smith Wigglesworth said, Lord, can I go now? And I believe that's how it went. It was, Lord, can I go now? And the Lord said, no, wait. And then after that, a buggy came along. And if Smith Wigglesworth had run along and said, Ooh, there's a guy who can go prosel. I can go preach to you, you will have missed the buggy. Mm-hmm. And the guy will have been in hell. Wait, mm-hmm. let me complete that story. <laughs> so Please the, do, sir. Smith will were preached to the guy in the little buggy, and a couple days later, he died. Mm-hmm. And how Smith Willisworth had gone away and been impatient and said, there's somebody else can go. I can go preach to, that man will have been in hell. Mm-hmm. And... Um, as a finishing of the story, his the the man that was driving the buggy, his wife called Smith Wigglesworth or got in touch with him a few days later or sometime later and said, mm-hmm. "Did you, did you do this? Did you minister to this man that was driving the cart and and explained a couple things to him?" And he said yes, and she told him that and thanked him for being obedient to the Lord because he got to come to Jesus Christ before he died. Yes, that was actually the the husband said to thank the person that led him to Christ. Mm-hmm. And I told his wife that, so obedience, mm-hmm. right? But that goes also to scripture, right? Because we've, and still there's a lot of discussion of sin, right? He that knows what's right to do and doesn't do it, to him it's sin, right? Yes. yes. Okay, so that's not just what's in the written word. It's also what the Lord is speaking and ministering to us. What word was what written word did Philip have in Acts when he was told to go down the road and it was desert? Mm-hmm. None, none, mm-hmm. none. The Lord spoke to him through the Holy Spirit, of course, and he immediately it says he immediately went. Mm-hmm. He immediately went, and guess what? Everything else was provided. It just said the road was desert, but then he meets this Ethiopian eunuch, mm-hmm. and he explains. The scripture to him, Philip explains the scripture to this eunuch. And then the eunuch goes, look, there's water over there. What's to prevent me from being baptized? Wait, it just said that the road was desert. But yet there's enough water to baptize a person. Mm -hmm. Everything is provided by the Lord. Everything that we need. I just want to add something to, when you talk about enmity, promise, you know, I love to look things up in the inner linear. So the uh, original word for that is uh, uh which means enmity, hostility, alienation. And the root word is from ekthras, which is hostility or by implication, a reason for opposition. Mm-hmm. So, so often, you know, we hear words and we only think of them in the context we're used to using them. But this is a pretty powerful I mean, you're, when you're in the flesh, you're 
you're in opposition to God. Mm-hmm. He's not in opposition to you. You are in opposition mm-hmm. to him. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Not a great place to be. No, no. And, you know, as we're, we're looking at this, there's always two sides of things, right? There is what we get as a result of our blessing and then what we miss out on as a result of our disobedience or failing to perceive what the Lord is trying to do for us. So as we're, we're talking about um, the scripture here and in all things, you know, as you bring up oftentimes, Dean, let's look at what we get to have. Life in Christ is relief, it's redemption, it's restoration, it's fulfillment, it's satisfaction, it's protection, it's joy. I mean, I can, I can go on and on and on about how good God is and how we should not forget all of his benefits because he has forgiven our transgressions and he's not holding them against us. He's not counting, um, counting those against us. So as we're looking at the word, let's, let's get back a little bit more, um, kind of a little bit more technical, I guess, and, and explaining and understanding what Paul is talking about here in the first couple verses. Um, verse three in particular says for what the law could not do and that it was weak through the flesh. God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin, he condemned sin in the flesh that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. So we talk about sometimes we, we use the same word, but different context to describe different things. So when he's talking here in verse three, for what the law could not do, that is not the law of sin and death. That's the law of Moses that he's talking about because the law of Moses was the only articulated means for men to achieve some level of righteousness, right? The right standard, keeping the law, making the sacrifices um, yearly. And so let's take a peek at Hebrews chapter 9, verses 13 and 14. Sorry about that. And it says verse 13, It says, for if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. So in that particular section of scripture, you see it's covering, covering down to verses five and six of Romans chapter eight. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the spirit, the things of the spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. And as we move forward, knowing that because we don't have condemnation of the things that we've done in our past, we can confidently come before Jesus and allow him to wash the remembrance of what we did before from our minds so that it's not a continual carrying around of who we used to be, but we are able to, without hindrance, renew our minds to who we are today in Jesus Christ. And then I want to look at verse uh, Hebrews chapter 10, verses 1 through 10 as well. It says, for the law, having a shadow, that's the law of Moses, having a shadow of the good things to come and not the very image of the things can never with these same sacrifices, which they offer continually year by year, make those who approach perfect. For then would they not have ceased to be offered. So saying if these temporary sacrifices were able to capture everything that they were meant to, you would have had to do it one time versus keep doing it year after year. One time would have been enough, but we know Jesus's blood was offered one time for all. And that in fact was enough. The law of Moses is a type and shadow. Let's see verse three of Hebrews chapter 10. But in those sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year. 
for it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. Therefore, when he came into the world, he said, and that's Jesus came into the world, sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me and burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin. You had no pleasure. Then I said, behold, I have come and the volume of the book. It is written of me to do your will, O God. Previously saying, sacrifice and offering, burnt offerings and offerings for sin you did not desire, nor had pleasure in them, which are offered according to the law, the law of Moses, that is. Then he said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God. He takes away the first, that he may establish the second. By that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. So in verse <clears throat> excuse me, back to Romans chapter eight, verse three and four. <clears throat> so what the law of Moses couldn't do and that it was weak through the flesh, because all we had were um, natural stand-ins, types and shadows. God did by sending his own son in a flesh, blood and bone body so that he qualified to both have authority, right? And recapture yes. what Adam lost or forfeited or gave away in the garden, but also... He came to do that as a result of the sin. He came as the lamb slain before the foundation of the world because sin was in the world and he needed to redeem it permanently. That the righteous requirement of the law and that this one, chapter four, I mean, verse four, that law is the spiritual law of life, right? Yes. There's a righteous requirement of the law that the law that supersedes the law of sin and death, the law of righteous standard that Jesus has, um, that God has as and what he set up, but Jesus has as well. The law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. So when Jesus came, he ruled over the law of sin and death by living a sinless, spotless, blameless life and yielding to do the will of God, yielding in full obedience that plus the fact that he had a natural body like we do, gave him the right and the authority to take the keys of hell and of death, right? Yes. It gave him yes. the ability and the, the qualifications to do such a thing. And when he did it, he provided an open door for us to enter in also. And likewise, all we have to do is believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he's talking to us here also and as we continue through the scriptures of going get your mind off of just limiting yourself to the natural don't see yourself purely and merely as a natural human being limited to the the confinements of what your your flesh oh my mom and my dad were these two people and this is the limitation of my existence is here in the natural and when i die there's nothing else there's nothing else governing there's there's no god watching or observing or it doesn't matter but he's saying instead put your mind in the place where god is not not usurp him but come up to where he is perceive him understand him welcome in his thought process and his way of doing things and um Put yourself back on God's side versus being in opposition to him. And verse eight, so then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. They that come to God must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. But the beginning part says of that verse, without faith, it's impossible to please God. So if we never leave and depart from our limits of a natural mind, we are not able or capable of faith, which is required to please God. It can't come out of your natural mind. Um, uh, some other um, Bible teachers will call it mental assent. You might mentally think you're agreeing, but you never come into the spiritual truth of knowing who God is and believing that and exercising that faith, which allows us to be able to please God. And then verses 9 and 10, talking to us, um, 9 in particular, about this is how we know we're the children of God. We all need to have those parameters so we have full assurance, right? He tells us yes. and articulates yes. it yes. right out who we are and how we know that we're the children of God. <clears throat> Excuse me. It says, but you are not in the flesh or limited by and merely human beings, but we are alive in the spirit as well. But we 
Um, it says, but in the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he is not his. So we can clearly, if, if we have not committed our life to Jesus Christ, and even if we are nice and we do nice things and other people say we're good people, if we haven't come through the door of Jesus Christ, we're still not his. But once we do come, we know that the spirit of God comes to dwell in us and that we are his. And verse 10 says, if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin or the body's ability to rule and make all the decisions for you. And that includes your soulish capacity, the carnal man that is your mind, your will and your emotions that takes a back seat and it's dead to sin or it's dead because of sin. But the spirit of life is now awakened on the inside of us because of the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And we have come and be a, to be a part of that. And then verse 11, but if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. That's not all. That's not only quickening us and bringing healing as a part of our covenant, which I absolutely love to apply that scripture for, but it's also um, bringing us out of a place where we're compelled by those instinctual reactions where we no longer have the ability to buffet the flesh, to control and subdue the natural man and to rule over sin nature. But now we are equipped with a life that comes through Jesus Christ and the power that he has working on the inside of us. So he gives us, he raises us up together, spirit, soul, and body, not just in times to come, but when we are renewed to him today, we have that ability we have that capacity and capability and we get to walk in it. We get to understand who Jesus is. We get to understand who we are in him and to begin to know ourselves in the same light and the same way that Jesus knows us. So it's no longer us looking and going, oh, you're just so-and-so who used to do such and such and such a thing. But now we get to go, no, I'm a son or a daughter of the most high God. I get to be what he says I am. I am who he says I am. And this is my inheritance. This is the heritage I have in him that I am a joint heir with Jesus Christ and an heir of God. So there's so much that we get to have and um, so much that Christ has done. And as we allow him to show us, as we further endeavor to get to do the things that God has already preordained and predestined for us to walk in. Let us encounter and do that with joy and full persuasion for com full confidence that God is not looking at us as anything other than his beloved children. And with the same love that he loves, he loved Jesus Christ. He has for us and be overjoyed and elated to go forward in that and strengthened and encouraged Amen. Well, there's a lot in there and what you said, honey. And let's let's give the listeners time to to process that and to meditate and let the Holy Spirit minister to them um, for today. Does that work? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, all right. And with that, can I get someone to close out in prayer, please? I will. All right, Layla, go for it. Lord, we just thank you for today, Lord, and for the things that we get to do in your name, Lord, the freedom that we find in Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, Lord, that you have freed us from bondage, Lord, and you have taken us from being captives and slaves of the enemy to being your sons and daughters, Lord, and that we have that relationship with you, Lord, that we can come to you with our needs, Lord, and our desires, and we know that you'll care for us, Lord. And that you would guide us and give us everything that we need, Lord, to succeed in your name. And so I just thank you for our listeners and our partners and for everybody that you have placed in our lives to help us, Lord, to be the safeguard and a watcher for us, Lord. And that Jesus is our watchman on the towers, Lord, that he protects us and covers us, Lord. And I thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. In Jesus' name, amen. And amen. All right. Well, we love you. God bless you and have a wonderful day.
Thank you for listening to A Day of Prayer. We trust the Lord that you are strengthened and encouraged in your relationship with Christ. Visit us on our website, adayofprayer.org, where you can check out our blog, find additional study resources, or shop the official A Day of Prayer store. Remember, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. So until next time, take care and God bless you.